board back into uh, session. Uh, I'm going to call the roll. We'll quickly establish a quorum. Supervisor Cerna? Here. Kennedy? P Peters? Here. Frost? Here. Natoli? Here. And you have a quorum. Okay, if we'll call our next item, please. Okay, now uh, we are going to item 56. It's the report back on procurement process and funding for transitional housing. Um, Supervisor Natoli, members of the board, what we are in front of you is a product from a couple weeks ago when we did the budget. There were very specific questions that the board was asking about transitional housing. And the to-do list for us was to figure out do we need additional capacity and if we do need additional capacity, what's the process for us to do procurement? And in that uh, discussion, there were questions that came up about the existing contractor. So for the last couple of weeks, Mr. Ferguson, Mr. Lake, and uh, County Council's office have reached out. They've been working with St. John's to answer some of the very specific questions that we have. Uh, given the shortness of the time, not all the questions can be answered as quickly as we thought they could be. So Britt's going to go over the report where we stand, and our recommendation is for you to hear Britt's uh, report and for us to come back to you in 30 days and give you a status update on where we stand with those items. Part B of the question you had asked about is that if the board wanted to have additional transitional um, housing units, what, what's the process for us to go through that? And our recommendation is to do an RFP and We'll, uh, if that's what the board desires, we'll get an RFP out on the street as quickly as possible and come back with an award to you at that point. So that's the structure of the report. I was going to have Mr. Ferguson just go over the nature of the questions we're asking and what status he has. And uh, Ms. Edwards and Mr. Lake are both here to talk about the transitional housing component. So, Britt. Thank you, Mr. Viola. Britt Ferguson, County's Chief Fiscal Officer. Um, um, so, uh, just to provide a, a short history of how we got here to um, sort of supplement what Mr. Gill said. Um, back in March uh, of 2017, your board approved the county's initiatives to reduce homelessness, which included a redesign of the emergency family shelter program and the addition of a family transitional housing program. Uh, in addition to other uh, family housing in the county system, the initiatives uh, call for funding one transitional housing program to serve 19 families. Uh, consistent with the initiatives, on May 15, 2017, the Department of Human Assistance, or DHA, released a request for proposals for transitional housing for families and received two proposals, one from St. John's Program for Real Change, who had been providing 19 units of transitional housing, and one from Volunteers uh, of America. Uh, Proposals were evaluated by independent review panel from the community, and based on that evaluation on July 2nd, DHA announced that the department would be recommending that VOA be awarded the contract for the provision of family transitional housing. Uh, as Mr. Gill indicated at your 2017-18 budget adoption hearings on September 6th, representatives of St. John's appeared and requested funding from the board in an annualized amount of 730,000 to continue to provide 19 family transitional housing units. At budget hearings, St. John made uh, the point that without the county's funding, St. John's would lose 767,000 annually in other grant funds and default on two forgivable loans, one from the city of Sacramento and one from the federal home loan bank for a total uh, impact on their organization of, of almost $3 million. Uh, at budget hearings, your board voted to include 540,000 to fund a second family transitional housing program for nine months in the adopted budget. On September 12th, your board approved the award of a contract to VOA to provide 25 units of family transitional housing for the remaining nine months of fiscal year 2017-18 for $505,000 with two potential one-year extensions of up to $730,000 each year. As Mr. Gill indicated, you requested a report back today on issues raised by St. John's request. Um, as we see it and as outlined in the report, there are at least five issues raised uh, by that request. Uh, the first was, does St. John's need the county's funding to avoid a default on the federal home loan bank or FHLB loan and the city of Sacramento loan? Second, will the county, a loss of county funding result in a loss of other funding and if so, how much? Uh, third, what is the county's interest and appropriate role in helping St. John's avoid a loan default and loss of other funding and what are the long-term implications of such action? 
Um, and then uh, uh, next, does the county need, in fact, need an additional 19 transitional housing units for families experiencing homelessness? And then finally, if the county does need additional transitional housing units, what is the appropriate process to procure them? As you uh, have seen in the staff report, and we'll hear this afternoon, and as Mr. Gill indicated, in the fairly short time available, we have not been able to resolve all of these issues. And normally, we would not have presented the board with a report that left so many questions unanswered, but we understood the board's desire to discuss St. John's request at this meeting, so we have tried to lay out as best we can what we know and what we don't know at this time. As Mr. Gill also indicated, at this point we're recommending that the board receive the report and direct us to continue to work with St. John's over the next 30 days to resolve the outstanding questions that have been identified, um, and if the board desires to contract for additional units of transitional housing, direct staff to initiate a request for proposal process. Uh, Cindy Cavanaugh, the county's director of homeless initiatives, and I will take a moment to address some of the issues in the staff report. Following our presentation, Cindy and I, Ann Edwards, director of human assistance, and other staff here are here uh, and available to answer any questions the board may have. Uh, turning to the first issue, uh, very briefly, does St. John needs the county funding to avoid default on the FHLB and City of Sacramento loan? Just a little bit of background on that. Um, in August of 2016, St. John received an $800,000 forgivable loan through the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco's affordable housing program to purchase and renovate property located at 8395 Jackson Road. According to St. John's, the property is being used to provide an additional 22 transitional housing bedrooms to serve 90 women and children. Um, and under the terms of the loan, St. John's does not need to make any debt service uh, payments, and the loan is, will be forgiven in 15 years if all programmatic conditions are met. According to St. John's, the FHLB loan was awarded based on scoring of the application, which included a number of, the number of clients served, and according to them, if county funding is eliminated, the score would drop below a required threshold. Uh, county was eliminated, our, our beds were not filled, and the loan would be at risk of default. Uh, we've requested a copy of St. John's loan application and FH FHLB evaluation and scoring. St. John's has not provided their loan application and has indicated that they did not receive the scoring breakout from the FHLB. We also asked for a contract contact person at the FHLB and St. John's declined to provide a name. So as of now, we can't confirm that loss of 19 units will actually or potentially trigger a default or what the consequences and remedy might be. Um, but we will, uh, and our intent is to continue to work with St. John's to try and uh, confirm and, and, and uh, um, th that information. Um, we did ask the question how our 19 units, which are not new, relates to the new housing units created as a result of the loan for the purchase of the new building. St. John's indicated that our units had been moved to the new building and the number of units requirement actually applies to two buildings. Again, we can't confirm this or how this works with their loan application. And again, we propose to continue to work with St. John's to try and resolve that issue. Uh, in addition, in May of 2017, St. John's received a 15-year, $600,000 forgivable loan from the City of Sacramento for the, for the same project. Staff has conducted a preliminary review of the loan documents provided by St. John's. It cannot really clearly identify how loss of county funding in and of itself will trigger a default, uh, but we'll continue to work with uh, St. John's on that issue. We've only had a little bit of time to look at that. Um, uh, if St. John's uh, interpretation of their loan uh, agreement is correct and uh, it would result, uh, loss of our funding would result in, uh, or loss of the 19 units would result in a default provision under the FHLB loan, uh, the question remains as to whether the loss of county funding would in fact mean St. John's could fill the 19 beds. So that really gets to the sort of financial condition of St. John's, what their other alternatives are uh, for uh, uh, providing funding to m maintain those units. Um, St. John's is indicated that they already raise over two million in private donations and that while they might be able to raise the additional 730,000 annually, it would take some time. Um, in the time available, we could not reach any conclusions about St. John's financial status or ability to raise additional funds. Uh, the report lays out some facts about their uh, fiscal situation that shows that in uh, basically in 14, in a calendar year 14 and 15, they have a calendar year fiscal year, they basically spent more than they brought in and reduced their unrestricted um, uh, uh, assets. Counties, counties do that from time to time. Yeah, they, we did. We have, <laughs> and then in uh, 2016, they uh, they they uh, they uh, uh, 
uh, uh, brought in in revenue more than they spend and increased their unrestricted assets to $1.1 million. Um, we have looked at their 2017 budget, which is, as you know, just a budget and expenditure plan, uh, but it shows that uh, they're budgeted to uh, bring in more in revenue than they spend, uh, generating a surplus of about $400,000. Um, there's some information in there about uh, questions about uh, their cash uh, flow situation, and again, we haven't had a chance to look at that in depth, and we, we hope to work with them on that to see what their actual cash um, uh, situation is. Uh, the second issue uh, is will the loss of funding result in the loss of other funding, the loss of the county funding result in the loss of other funding. We focus particularly on matching requirements. Uh, they're, they're, they do receive federal funds that have a, a match requirement, uh, specifically the CalFresh SNAP to Skills program. Uh, that's a fairly new grant for them, uh, so it, it's really not so much a historical issue as a, as a future issue. Um, they do receive, uh, bring in over $3 million, or at least in their budget, are projected to bring in over $3 million in other funding besides grant funding. Um, it's not clear to us to what extent that money would be available to uh, match the, um, the, the SNAP to Skills program. The only requirement of that federal funding is that the match not be other federal funding. So there, it is legally possible to use other funds to match that. Um, and St. John's just recently, because we've been meeting as we've been going along, clarified that some of the lost revenue would be what they refer to as per capita funding for, uh, for other grants. Uh, we don't have information uh, from other grants. We don't have information on on what those grants are, how they're structured, and so we need some time to look at that. The issue there, of course, is per capita funding suggests that um, uh, for our for the for for our uh, program, uh, there they would get other funding to help supplement our money uh, for for the beds that we have. And part of the question there is how much of that is covering fixed costs, which uh, which would be there anyway, and how much is is covering uh, variable costs that would actually decrease if our beds weren't in use and how that all fits together. And again, we need some time to look at that. Um, and then the third issue, uh, what is the county's interest and appropriate role in helping St. John's avoid loan default and loss of other funding and what are the long-term implications uh, of such an action? Um, so um, as I think was, was uh, they made clear in their presentations to you at budget hearings, uh, St. John's request for additional funding did not really focus on the need for 19 additional transitional housing units. Um, they really focused on requesting general, general assistance in order to avoid the loan default and the loss of other revenue. And again, we haven't been able to confirm whether that is in fact true, uh, but we, we will work with them on that. But, but, that, but the question raised here is whether and under what circumstances uh, should the county be the, essentially the funder of last resort for nonprofit organizations. And I, as we said in our uh, staff report, uh, we generally don't believe it's prudent for the county to assume that role. Uh, our primary role is to, is to provide services to the, to the citizens in our community, either directly through our staff or through contracting, um, and um, uh, not necessarily to support um, uh, nonprofits uh, financially. Uh, but. Um, we did identify that if the board is interested in providing financial assistance to a nonprofit organization, there are four uh, factors that probably should be considered. One, what services is the organization providing and does the county believe those services are needed? Second, are there other organizations that could provide those services more effectively or at less cost to the county, as you might determine through an RFP process, for example? Um, third, can the county ensure that the services we want will be, in fact, provided for our funding? And then finally, what, what level of funding will be needed and how long will it be needed? That gets the financial situation, gets to um, you know, how long a commitment might be needed. The staff report uh, addresses some of these issues and again, in some cases, we can't uh, fully answer those. Uh, the fourth issue is, does the county need another 19 family transitional housing beds? And I'm gonna let uh, Cindy Cavanaugh go ahead and um, address that issue. Good afternoon, Cindy Cavanaugh, County Director of Homeless Initiatives. I'm not sure I can speak that fast and concisely, but I'll try. Uh, staff does not recommend funding additional transitional housing beds for families experiencing homelessness at this time in its newly redesigned uh, family system under County Homeless Initiative number one. Rather, staff recommends completing the implementation, which is well underway of that initiative, and close monitoring of the results, including looking at 
at uh, how long folks are homelessness, how long uh, assistance is provided based on which kind of assistance, um, how many exits, how, how are people finding their way to permanent housing and are successful in that, what's the increased income and employment and long-term stability. So these are all measures we're looking at uh, monitoring with these initiatives and, and interventions. We would consider then expanding the most critical components to impact family homelessness based on that experience and outcome. So it could be more diversion assistance, help people prevent, prevent them from ever becoming homeless as long as they can stay in safe housing, maybe more sheltering, uh, perhaps more rehousing services, particularly helping people in this tough rental market, or more transitional housing or even permanent supportive housing. My best guess at this time is that we have rather uh, thinly funded the diversion assistance and given everything we know about who's entering homelessness, that could be a very effective strategy. But also on the rehousing side, we know this uh, extra help is needed in finding housing in this tough market. Just a quick reminder of the objectives of the family system. We want to help families avoid homelessness altogether with the diversion assistance. We want to provide easier access to shelter and, and be, be able to shelter everyone, particularly literally homeless families and families with high barriers um, to, uh, to rehousing and stability. And we want to help families return to permanent homes as quickly as possible, supporting them either um, in a longer term stay, as in transitional housing, or, can, or in supporting them as they transition to permanent housing more quickly. Now you'll recall that, and, and certainly Britt covered, that we did not have a one-size-fits-all in our response to family homelessness and recognized many pathways out of, home, out of homelessness. Uh, we've, uh, Brett talked about the, the 19 measure for uh, 19 units for transitional housing, um, but we also funded uh, approximately 268 families in the shelter system. These are within the context of other resources within our continuum. So I wanted to make sure we understood that according to the last housing inventory count, which I believe is undercounting in a few areas, there are 89 family units of transitional housing with 238 beds and 103 uh, units for families in shelters for 300 beds. Not quite on par, but you know, pretty close to, to on par to each other, which is which is probably a bit heavy on the transitional housing side. I have a couple questions, uh, Supervisor Cerner, Supervisor Kennedy. Sure, sure. Thank you. Wait. Yeah, no, you, you say wait. You want to go? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I'll wait till she's done. Yeah, go I, ahead. I was almost done. I just a couple more sentences. Um, just to remind us that we were investing 1.35 million for those 238 families and about uh, about 730 thousand for the 19 families annually. Uh, there is a bit of good news in the 2017 uh, point in time count, which um, which might be uh, indicated from this. Uh, robust CalWORKs resources coming into the, into the uh, system for both rehousing and shelter and emergency assistance. Um, families uh, with children declined, the homelessness declined by 25% from 2015. Uh, we know sometimes things are undercounted, but that is what the count said. And I'm, I am done, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Cindy. Okay, Supervisor Cernas, Supervisor Kennedy. Okay, um, first of all, please bear with my voice. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess I, I'm scratching my head a little bit because the question is, does the county need another 19 transitional housing beds? And I think all of us would agree, of course we do. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course we do. we do. We need more of everything. We need more of everything. So, to say that you're not, to, to answer the question by saying we're not recommending funding, there are two different things. I think you need to preface the answer uh, substantially with, all things being equal, or given the limited amount of resources to, to implement the trajectory we set, our, set for ourselves, the, the initiatives, this is the best funding, uh, this is the best location for, the best placement for the funding, all other things being equal. But of course we need more transitional housing, just like we need more permanent supportive, just like we need more shelter space. We need more of everything in the continuum, as far as I'm concerned. Point, point well taken. Supervisor um, Kennedy. Actually, it's like, <laughs> that's exactly how I was going to start. Um, 
but so let me go to a specific point though that you I mean and what so what the staff report says I mean it's been characterized as we don't need more as Supervisor Serta said which I don't think you'll find anybody in this room that would think we don't need more but what it does say is that transitional transitional beds are not the most critical gap in our system and I think that's part of what we forget to do is we forget to look at this as a system uh, and we look at it as you know uh, this program and that program and that program and that's where we got here frankly uh, that's where also when we had the divine intervention to hire you uh, it was to come up with a system instead of doing this is stop gap, gap measure after stop gap measure and and having no accountability and all and I think that, that, that that's that's the critical point to be made here and I agree with Supervisor Cerner. you did say diversion assistance I believe maybe I'm putting words in your mouth but I don't want to do that but I believe you said diversion assistance is where you as our staff that makes recommendations would if we were going to put more money at this point would prefer to put more funding in over transitional housing is that I hear that right um, I would not recommend anything at this time give our system a chance we are this is probably the initiative and the component that we are most excited about if I were to guess knowing that we gave I don't know 30,000 to diversion assistance um, that's not gonna that's not gonna go very far we're testing the principle so that was my best guess at this point l let us go forward and implement which is an interesting point from I mean I would think most staff people sitting there at the podium being asked the question would say yeah I'll take it I mean I will take fund I will take more money honestly it's the individual it's the individuals on the street if I if you were to ask me where I will answer where which I think is with what's going to happen this winter what's going to happen with enforcement we need to put money there for for services for that okay. I will give an answer yeah. but for this okay I got it thanks I want to weigh in because um, some of this is a bit of a puzzle to me and I appreciate your explanation uh, and obviously we went through going back to last last fall and even uh, last summer through the workshops and, and, and I get it that you know we worked through you know a planning effort and certainly set some priorities but I, I to the point made a moment ago by Supervisor Kennedy I'm gonna come at it a little differently but um, I can't see how this community would give up beds. Now, we don't know exactly what would happen if we didn't fund this. This board certainly has expressed a desire to set aside that funding. And when I look at this report, and obviously you're responding to questions by this board and, and uh, uh, doing due diligence, but again, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled, in all honesty, that we would, with what's contained here and what's been presented, continue to say well because we had this plan that that's where the money needs to go if the board desires to retain beds that either are coming online or have been made available or units that have been made available and I guess my answer to all this would be unless we're darn sure we've solved shelter issues for women and children in this community then we best hold on to what we've got in this community and build upon that, and that's part of what the plan is. And and and, I, and, and it's not this is not directed so much at you, Cindy, as it just, you know, as as I read through this, I said this to, to Navgill yesterday, and I'm going to you know, say it here. You know, there there was a lot loaded into this res response back, and yet the bottom line is, and, and and the thing that got to me the most though was this very question: Do we need it? I mean, th that question. Y it's self-answered in this community yeah we've had these chambers full of folks we need it and to argue that you know because we chose to put additional general fund money aside to grow our effort to do a full shelter service uh, you know a shelter program to bolster other efforts that somehow women and children fall out of that equation and fall down that ladder and that the pathways that's the other thing is that we have a program that's it's criticized, uh, not so subtly in this, for being a clean and sober approach, for one that has a vocational aspect to it that may require a time in the program that's longer, but hopefully when people come out at the end of it, they've gotten their children back that are already, a lot of times, outside of that. We reunify children and their families. You help them overcome addictions. You help them get their job training, get their lives back together. 
why we would say no to that for, for three quarters of a million dollars when they're raising 10 times that in, 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 in the private sector to support this, that question to me is a puzzle because here, everything I read here, certainly this board can give the direction, we set the money aside, we ought to be glad we've got a provider in this community, along with other providers that are willing to. Siting a shelter is no easy task. Bringing beds on is no easy task. And we can have different pathways. And I think what you've brought, certainly sending your time with us, is you know, looking to, to broaden that. But I think the Supervisor Cerner's question and comment is that we need more of all of this. And why, when we've got a provider that's willing to do that, we're, 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 we're putting up such a fuss about this. We can certainly hold people accountable. But, but, but I guess I just don't get it. So I was only meaning to answer from a systems perspective, what does the system, what is, and, and really Supervisor Cerna is correct, the, the right question is what is the most critical need? Not having, not feeling this was the opportunity to, to revisit all of that, I didn't cover everything. Trying to use data to answer the question, you know, how are we doing with family homelessness? And it, it does raise relative to other things. 95% were sheltered in the point in time. Uh, we are increasing the bed capacity to, from 19 to 25. Certainly this board can decide that it wants additional transitional housing for families. But I'm just trying to answer the question from a systems perspective using data, uh, what do we know? I guess I just would, would simply say that 44 is better than 25 any time. The math is pretty simple. And that even if it doesn't, you know, include male ha head of household, still I think when I look at other parts of our system, and, I, and again, I didn't really get the sense that there was this, you know, there was a lot of focus on St. John's, and that was some of the questions that were asked, but what about uh, reunification in children that are in, in, the, in a foster care system, those that are placed out of home, you know, just bringing them back under the umbrella of a program that could do that, one, the benefit of the family, but just the financial benefit. There's no analysis of, of what those positive impacts are to the system, assuming they are positive, I guess nobody even analyzed that. Okay, Susan Peters. Um, th this discussion that's going on about whether we need 19 more beds or not, I, I, I kind of took what you said if you, it, to relate it more to money, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, that if you had 750,000, or in this case, 540, that you would spend it in a different area. Is that what you're saying? I, I, I wasn't asked that question in this report, but I believe the system has, uh, uh, has I would come forward with a rec different recommendation if I were given that amount of money than transitional housing well, for families. Someone said that you were hired through divine inspiration. Uh, so. Wow. <laughs> well, I am asking the question. <laughs> yeah, I think we both are. Yeah. Yeah, this would not be my recommendation for the highest and best use. I think we have... It's a quite a bit of money. If you look at the, what we're trying to do with a much larger unsheltered population, uh, whether it's individuals or, I mean, basically individuals, we're doing it much more on a shoestring. So I feel we are on the right track with the family system. Um, if uh, is it an ironclad no family would be homeless? Probably not. Is it that we are creating the systems to really uh, capture those and uh, move them out of homelessness quickly? Then the answer is yes. Traditionally, we have not been able to call some programs um, and say, can you place a family? If you want us to solve homelessness, you need to let us get the system that works to do that. Supervisors, if I may jump in real, real quick here, uh, just to provide some historical contextual reminder of uh, what we presented a few weeks ago at the budget hearings. Um, we stood to lose the, uh, the 19 beds that uh, St. John's provided when we lost the CalWORKs money that we were using to pay for transitional housing. The board voted to put general fund money in to replace that. We went through a procurement process to use those funds. And we, at, with the board's approval, contracted for 25 beds. So if you compare the number of transitional housing beds we have now versus what we had just six months ago, we have more capacity for transitional housing. So I wanted to point that out. Uh, and, and I'll speak as the uh, Deputy, Direct, De Deputy County Executive for Social Services that uh, uh, if th th I, I do believe there is a more impactful use of $540,000 than add additional transitional housing on top of what our current capacity is. I think diversion money, I think uh, more rehousing funds 
to support uh, what we're going to be doing with our rehousing shelter and our flexible supportive rehousing. I think those will have more impact on the overall system, including for families, uh, than additional funding for transitional housing. Okay, I, I think one of the problems or struggles I've had with the discussion over the last couple of months is the board approved a program uh, for homelessness uh, in June and we haven't let it begin to work yet and we're, we continue to pick it apart and, and uh, I don't know if you'd say criticize it, but certainly not giving it a chance to work and my worry about that is just spending money willy-nilly is is not if it's unfocused it's it's wasted money um, I uh, don't know what's going on with st. John's with uh, being unresponsive to questions uh, posed by county staff uh, I would set that aside and I uh, if the board decides it wants to go to this money I would say we have to go through an RFP process because that's what the county uh, Ordinances say, but I, but I, I want to be sure that we, after we did all this work on the homeless program uh, that we're getting ready to start, that we have funded it to a level that it will, could be successful. So, thank you. Okay. Sewer Frost. I want to direct the conversation back to the um, comments that you made in relation to. You had been meeting with St. John's and requesting information, and you're still working your way through that information. Does the county have a legal obligation to uh, get to the bottom of you know the money and where it's going and and how it's applied and whether or not it's needed to sustain a business? And is it you mentioned is it appropriate to fund them to to keep them from going into default on a loan. So do we have, we do not have the information, it sounds like we there's more information we need from St. John's. Are they able to, will they be able to bring that information or are we, is that in the process? So in terms of the legal, I don't know that we have a legal obligation. I think the way I would characterize it is sort of a, uh, fiduciary responsibility to be prudent in use of public funds and when you have a request before you that involves what is essentially a request to uh, shore up an organization potentially as long as 15 years which is the extent of their um, um, forgivable loans uh, it would be prudent to make sure that it's really needed what the consequences would be uh, and um, to make sure that um, to understand what's going on both with how the organization operates in terms of the benefits we're receiving and the um, uh, what is really needed and, and how that fits into their finances and how our money would be used. So um, in terms of providing that information, they have provided some information. They provided uh, a substantial amount of information. There's still uh, uh, a significant amount that we have not yet uh, seen, um, some of which um, I don't know if we'll be able to get it all. They have uh, committed to providing us some more information and our our intent is to continue to work with them as long as we can to try and uh, get that information so that we can do the sort of analysis that would allow us to provide answers to the questions we to your board the answers to your board uh, for the questions that we've identified as we think would be necessary to to to, to uh, consider that sort of a request but we're not we're not talking about a 15-year bridge we're talking about 2017-18 correct so, so the only request they made to you was to continue to fund them uh, because if their, their position was, if you didn't, they would lose, they would potentially default on loans and lose match funding. Um, those loans are 15-year loans. They didn't ask for 15 years of funding, but those loans are 15-year loans. We did ask them, one of the questions we asked them was, so, so what long-term financial planning have they done? Have they done multi-year forecasts? Knowing that they just received a loan and it expanded their program significantly, ha uh, had they done any, do they, did they have any multi-year forecasts so we could get a sense of sort of their longer-term financial situation? They said they had not done that. So that's the sort of thing we want to look at carefully, obviously, in the context of this kind of a request. And I just want to also just mention that I think St. John's has done great 
work. And um, my heart wants to fund them. My heart wants to fund everyone. But um, so, you know, I, I, it sounds like we don't have all the information we need at this point. That's what I'm, is that what I'm hearing? Yes. I'm hearing that. That's correct. Well, it's a question A and B. A, we're going to continue to work with St. John's to get the information that we need. B, if the board so desires, we can do an RFP to procure more than 19 beds. And that will be the question. Whoever bids will end up being a successful bidder. We're not predetermining that. But you're saying at this point in time, we really don't need 19 more beds. That is what our staff looked at the question, and that's what we're coming back with, is their recommendation is, including mine, is that we have a system, that's what it is. I do um, apologize that maybe the language could have been written a little bit differently, that we did not mean to imply that there's no need to have them. It's just a system that we've put in place that you gave us the authority to, we're executing on that. Of course, additional money, additional beds, we can always use that. We could have written that differently, but at this point, with what uh, Ms. Cavanaugh was saying is that her recommendation through Paul has been that if you're going to have additional funds available, her recommendation will be to put it somewhere else. Supervisor Cerna. Thanks. So I want to make sure I understand this correctly, Britt, because <clears throat> I think I, what I heard you suggest is that St. John's competed, they weren't selected. The funds that they were competing for for this particular use um, were was intended to complement an assemblage of other funding sources, including loans. No. No. Okay. The, That's why the, I'm asking. The funds that they competed for were intended to purchase 19, and then it turned out to be 25 beds okay. of so how transitional housing. They. Uh, the, uh, as we understand it, and again, we're still looking at this, but they are basically saying that they, either through match or through this um, uh, per capita funding, are able to draw down other funds from other grants to supplement our money in order to provide additional services uh, uh, as part of their program for ours and others, I presume. We don't know exactly how that we haven't yet been able to figure that out exactly, but we, we weren't we weren't intentionally structuring it so that they could uh, draw down other funds. Supervisor, Sergeant, I think the confusion came in last month when we've been discussing this. We have a couple of documents that I think, as they were making their case on how vital this funding is for them, there was a linkage that seems to be created. And there's a document we attached that says, "Here's county funding; it leverages this." So that started the question that I mentioned a couple of meetings ago, is that what's, going, what's the status of our money? Is it leveraging? Is it not leveraging? And that's what Britt's getting at, is that he's looking at it. If our money is leveraging that, I'm just purely speculating, I'm not saying that's the case, is that then issue for us becomes it's not a gap till June 30th. Then it becomes a 15-year issue. Structural gap. Structural yeah. gap. Okay. And it's, I'm not suggesting we should take it on. We just want to be able to advise you right. what the structural gap is. St. John's might have other means of fundraising, have other donors. So that's their business. Our question is more just to see that document that we received and verify what's the information in there. I guess the other way to ask it is, and maybe it's better suited to ask St. John's uh, executive staff, but is it the case that <clears throat> there was uh, a mission that St. John set out to do in terms of transitional housing? It relied heavily on being awarded the funds. They took a risk. The, 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 the competition didn't work out the way they wanted, and now we find ourselves in this situation. I guess what I'm asking is how true is that statement? I think that's probably that's, that's pretty accurate. Probably a f yeah. fairly accurate statement. From our vantage From point our perspective, that. yeah. yeah. I want to ask a question, Britt, Mr. Cern, if you had anything else. Okay. Just on this, uh, is the issues raised in the report and relates to the cash flow. Well, obviously, you had a big capital mm -hmm. program. And True. And I think you identified that. It's certainly in writing. You said it in your comments. But I guess there aren't too many nonprofits. And again, I jokingly said it about counties. But, um, you know, again, we have a little more reliance on quarterly distributions and so forth. And, and 
nonprofits, whether they be you know big, medium, or or or, or small, uh, you know have to work to raise the money through, and whether they do it through spaghetti feeds or through large events or through philanthropy uh, amongst their board members and and, and, and others, and uh, you know it's it's certainly a reasonable uh, point to talk about, but um, again, I just. It, 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 it seems to me that um, you know you want you want an organization that's financially solvent, but if, if they can, the contract with the county has been provide the 19 units of service. I guess my question is, have they provided that and their ability to do that? Now, obviously, if the program were to close, they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and I think you know when when I saw that information earlier in the summer, I'll just say from my perspective that. You know, people are going to make the case. Obviously, how it's going to impact them, and you know, you can tie it to you know loans or to other operational aspects. But it, it, the cash flow issue, you're you're going to have you know, it's going to be up and down, ebb and flow through the course of a year, maybe even over through several several years. And, and I saw is there something particularly you know outstanding or odd about the St. John's versus other nonprofits and I doubt that we've bored into other nonprofits yeah. as, as much as this but but obviously this points before us so I guess I'm I'm curious for your take on yeah, that. Yeah, so um, uh, our internal audits division uh, did uh, 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 conduct a review of their uh, uh, fiscal review uh, of a couple prior years worth of uh, funding and did identify some cash flow issues and of course they have had some cash flow issues and as they've pointed out and as you note uh, their point is well they it's sort of a timing issue they have in the early part of the year they have more expenses and less revenue if we haven't been able to confirm that we want to look at that I think I think part of the issue here and why we've really focused on this question of fiscal viability is less because of the contracting for 19 units that's partly an issue of need but more on the issue of the request for what is essentially potentially long-term financial support to deal with their their overall financial situation and so one of the questions that we had was you know in so let's assume that in fact their understanding which um, and that, so they themselves said they haven't seen their rating sheet but their understanding of how their loan works is right and it would potentially jeopardize their loan um, is their capacity, what is their capacity in the short term or long term to generate other revenue? And that's, that's, it, that's the context in which we're looking at that, their overall financial situation. If, it, if it's in fact positive, if in fact they do have one, over $1 million in, in, uh, in unrestricted assets, uh, if they have cash, uh, I know if they have a line of credit, if, they have, if they're gonna run a surplus this year, that might suggest maybe they don't need our money as much as they thought they did in order to get by. On the other hand, if they are in more dire financial, if it's more less positive than that, uh, they may need our money. But on the other hand, then we want to look at what you know, what what is their long-term situation in terms of uh, what kind of commitment ultimately is made w when we go through the RFP process. So um, I think that is really more what we were looking at. It was it was the context in which they made the plea for your support, which, as you recall, was really not a plea. Or an argument that we needed a 19 additional beds. It was more an argument they needed this in order to um, uh, deal with their own financial situation. But let me ask you one other question. It was touched upon in the report, and I know it's been something that I mean, obviously county staff, DHA, and maybe your office as well. But with regards to the SNAP funding, I know there were some, some um, um, differences that needed to be ironed out, and I think we saw it, you know, both St. John's but county, you know, other state and federal uh, entities to weigh in on that. But um, you know, there's, there's this reference to disallow a significant amount of claims. Uh, I thought that those, most of those issues if, had been resolved, and yet I still understand that there's outstanding maybe several hundred thousand dollars uh, in claims. And, and if we've if we've resolved issues, then why is that we still have that amount of money? And so I guess I need explanation. Behind I'll ask that. Ann Edwards to address that specific question, but I will just mention that the context that we were looking at that in is if part of the uh, uh, other money that they draw down. Is premised on drawing down. They've put in their budget a, a million two or so in money from the SNAP program. Um, if they're not going to get that for reasons unrelated to our contribution, then that really gets to the issue of how much money they would actually re lose as a result of our uh, reduction in funding. And, and, and before before you leave, though, I just the point I would make about cash flow that if we're sitting on claims that are legitimate and in and, and payable. Then we could certainly help the cash flow a bit too. Again, if those services are being provided and they're claimable, so thanks. But I'd like to hear from Ann where we are with. Good afternoon, Ann yeah. Edwards, Department of Human Assistance. Um, uh, 
DHA has been working very closely with St. John's staff to reconcile um, invoices around the SNAP to Skills program. It's a new, complicated, complex program, and um, I know it's been a huge challenge for St. John's, as it has for DHA staff as well. We've come a long way in the last six, eight weeks um, in terms of really getting a better handle on what's allowable, what's not allowable, and um, the means in which we um, receive invoices and backup documentation. We're not completely there yet, but we're getting very, very close. And um, it's been a joint effort. Um, I have to give a hats off to um, Heidi Stauffer from St. John's, uh, their fiscal person. She's been extraordinary to work with, and um, we're getting really close to having it all resolved. But it is a work in progress. And if I may just add on, on Anne's behalf, she won't say it, but her, her staff have done a yeoman's job in trying to implement uh, something that is really breaking new ground. So the, the confusions over the regulations is an understandable thing when you're trying to do something new, and her staff did a yeoman's job. Well, no, I appreciate that, and again, I, I'm aware of that, but so that we, we, it's your belief that within the next few weeks, I'm just, I'm saying few weeks, but if that's not it, if it's a few months, but in a short amount of time that the um, claims, uh, uh, assuming they're appropriately submitted and so forth, that those can be, those reimbursements can be made? I didn't speak to the person that's working on it before coming here today, so I can't answer that completely. But I know that each claim is a binder about this thick. Um, it takes a fair amount of time to go through and analyze it. This is a high-risk program because of the federal dollars. And um, we know the program will be audited, and so we're being very, very cautious. Um, we have been processing and paying as fast as we possibly can. Um, there are still some outstanding, and there's still some outstanding issues that we're going back and forth with with St. John's, but everyone is giving it more than 100%. Well, and the reason I ask is because when I, talk about cash, when I hear about cash flow on one hand, and then obviously this is part of the overall spectrum of providing services and claiming for services, and if there are claims, again, going back to April or May, for whatever reasons, good or otherwise, that's still, you know, for a, a nonprofit to be in the latter part of September, and not being able to get you know some uh, resolution around that again, and then just again not saying people aren't working hard, but I just that you know that can affect you know the bottom line you know because again then other things and you're pulling from other funds, you're waiting for other monies to come in, and so it certainly can can uh, have a significant effect on a, significant effect on a, on, a, on a nonprofit. So and I know we want to be careful. I get that. So okay, thanks. All right. Um, any other board member questions? I don't have anybody signed to speak, but oh, I, I see Renee's in here, and I do have some folks now. Okay, I have uh, Michelle Steve and uh, Mark Weiss. Uh, I don't know in particular order, so, um, and if there are others, certainly. <laughs> Joe, good afternoon. Thank I'm not going to put the Thank clock you. on. My There's name's a lot of information here, so we'll try to keep this concise, but I want to. Yeah, to yeah, I'm going to try to, too. Um, my name's Michelle Steve. I represent St. John's. Um, First, want to thank you for your leadership and um, at least setting aside additional monies for transitional housing for single mother-led families dealing with addiction, um, wanting their children to be safe. Um, just so you're aware, we now sit on a waiting list, a daily waiting list of over 500 women and children. So I appreciate that the home, and, and that's after our expansion. I appreciate that the homeless count shows a drop, but that's definitely different than what we're seeing at St. John's. Um, we are definitely working with the county uh, staff to better uh, help them better understand our program. There's been a lot of misunderstandings. There's a lot of inaccuracies in that report. We provided, just to give you a sense, 260 pages of information. We sat down with them for a couple hours on, um, what's today, Tuesday, so Monday morning, and we have some more information that we need to uh, bring forward, and we'll do that. We're really committed to, to clearing up the understandings and the, and the inaccuracies. But I want to um, point out a couple of really important facts that continue to come up. One is we're not talking about 19 beds. People keep saying 19 beds. I've had to correct staff many times on this. It's 19 units um, for families, which is really 57 women and children. That's a really important point that needs to you know, be uh, accurately represented. We are a nonprofit that in the last 10 years has gone from a million dollar nonprofit 
that was 80% reliant on this county contract serving about 100 women and children a day to a program now that serves up to 270 a day for 12 to 18 months. That same county contract, the one we're here talking about today, represents less than 10% of our funding. So St. John's has worked really hard to diversify our funding sources to not be coming back to the county and asking for more and more, even though we've grown and grown. And it's a really good thing, and I think it's something that needs to be um, better recognized by county staff when we've been able to to uh, bring monies in from outside funders to help expand our program. FHLB has given over $1.6 million to St. John's. The City of Sacramento is an unprecedented uh, gift to help us grow our services. And it's been a really uh, positive thing. And it's really a shame to me that that's um, looked on um, in not a positive light by, by staff. That said, we're committed to help like I said, can, uh, clear up these inaccuracies and the and the misinformation, and we'll continue to work with them to do so. I um, want to say a couple other things. Um, Cindy, in her remarks, Cindy Kavanaugh um, said, "Well, you know, there was a lot of guesses. I can guess that this is going to happen. I can guess that that's going to happen." St. John's is a proven model, and we don't work for everyone, but for women and children struggling with addiction, struggling with domestic violence, struggling with lack of education, it works. These women come in; they're a drain on the community in terms of public subsidies, and they come out, and they're a contributor to the community. They're earning over $1,850 a month. That is something that we should all be celebrating, and that's something that is very, very unique in this community, especially as it relates to single mother-led families. I think in close, I just, again, want to thank you for your um, leadership. Again, we're committed to working to clear up some of this misinformation, but today, we really need to know that we're going to have you behind us as we um, close out our contract. Our contract ends on September 30th. And it's really, really important that we know we have your commitment behind us. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Any questions of Michelle? OK, none. Mark? Good afternoon, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman and totally members of the board. Mark Weiss uh, here as a board director, uh, member of the board of directors of St. John's programs. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Michelle had everything. You guys have bantered about this. We've all have for since February when, when, when the matter first came out. We don't want to be here next year. You hit it on the head, Supervisor Tully. All of you did that we're looking at a 10% gap in the annual budget right now. Programs are coming in place. We want to become self-sufficient. Um, this will help get us there so we're not back here next year. There's been a lot of growth, new programs, the CCTRP program, the SNAP program, which Ms. Edwards said, it is a complicated program. Staff has worked diligently on it to try and get it funded. It's behind, it's caused problems. That's why we're here also. Um, all of the above, you're, you're <clears throat> the administrative time you've dedicated, you've directed staff, your time, heck, that's probably half of the $540,000 right there. But I want to thank you all for, for getting to this point. If we have to go to an RFP for $540,000, let us do it. If you can make a direction on it right now, and hopefully the next year, 18 months, we're not back here again because we are self-sufficient. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. OK. <clears throat> thank you, Mark. Thanks, Michelle. Anybody else uh, on this item? OK. If not, I'll bring it back to the board then. Uh, Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. <clears throat> Kennedy, so, Michelle asked for, at the end of her testimony, asked for um, an understanding of the board's support for St. John's. I don't think there's any of us that don't support St. John's. Um, but this is a more surgical question about, um, about funding for a specific use and getting through some misunderstandings. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, um, and then looking at you, Mr. Gill, uh, if it's the will of the board to give some indication that there's interest in an RFP process. What, is, what, are, what are the outside dates of award? I'm seeing four weeks. Is that a month? A month? Well, that's four weeks. <laughs> I'm getting information. It typically takes about four months. We could okay. certainly um, shorten that time frame should it be your desire. And that by no and that's means. from beginning. That's from right. drafting it, 
releasing it, bidders conference, applications, review process, posting, protest period, all of that. And again, that doesn't mean that at the end of the process, St. John's necessarily is selected. That is accurate. And we can look at changing some of the timelines on that. If the board, if that's the direction we get into, I think I would like to work with staff, see if we can get this back to you as quickly as possible. We already have an RFP that we did on this, so there is part of this time crunch, we can mm. take that out. Some of the appeal process, we gotta keep that in there for fairness purpose, but I think if that's the desire, it won't be four months, we'll be in sooner than that. Okay, thanks. Okay, Supervisor Kennedy. <coughs> yeah, I have uh, several things. Uh, one is, um, I guess one of my uh, threshold levels of discomfort is that, you know, we've had hearing after hearing after hearing. Uh, we went through painstaking um, investigation into what programs we think will work. We put together a system. Um, the system is something that I really appreciated because it's, for the first time more than ever before, it's data-driven. Um, and it's a fairly robust and complex system. And here we are taking it apart before it's even had a chance to work, to be, to be implemented. Uh, not only that, but I've got two people at least that have right here on the staff said that if you want to give resources to the homeless issue, that there are other areas that they feel would be more cost effective and more effective, meaning help more people, um, more homeless people, if we were to put these in other areas. It, it's, however good it makes us feel to put it in one area, if I'm being told by people who have the data, who live by that data, uh, who have analyzed that data, and uh, are our industry experts telling me that this money could be spent better to help more people, that gives me great pause. Um, so I'm, I'm really uncomfortable in overriding that and going in a different direction, frankly, because it makes me feel good. And, 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 and to be honest with you, giving St. John's $540,000 would probably make me feel pretty good. But I, I just, from a sound governmental public policy standpoint, I, I've got some real hesitation with it. That's number one. The second thing is is that the only way that I could ever support going forward with some, with dedicating more resources to transitional housing over giving it to some other areas that we've been told might be more beneficial uh, would be through an RFP process. Um, that's just that's that's transparency. It's 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 you know an honest way of doing it. Um, you know, let's face it. St. John's would stand a good chance of prevailing in that. I mean, they, they've done good work in the past. But I want to put another layer on it that probably isn't going to be received real well by staff um, in that it would most likely uh, make it difficult to really shorten that time period. And I just want to throw, out, throw this out. And if it's not here, then I'd like to look at doing it somewhere else. And that's, um, you know, we've been working the county staff has uh, as, as well as my office and uh, with the city and with Sutter Hospital with social finance to look at a pay for uh, success model and infusing that in and, and matter of fact we had a meeting recently over with city staff and county staff to talk about um, where are some opportunities we could do that maybe to pilot it because it's fairly new to this area now homeless programs have been paid for through um, pay for success in Massachusetts, uh, Santa Clara, Los Angeles, Denver. So I mean, it's not a new thing. It's out there, it's happened. They have the matrices already in place that you could put into an RFP and make it part of this process. Um, I'd really like to see that. Uh, it can be done in a couple of ways, one of two ways. It, it could be you find a third party, which according to social finance, who I would recommend we work with to put together something, and frankly, they volunteer to do so. Um, they have actually said that as opposed to things like, and I'm not picking on anything the city's doing, but as opposed to whole person care, 
you know, the report that they came up with for the city and the county uh, basically said that our programs of housing and supportive housing and the different things that we're doing are far more uh, attractive to outside funders than would be whole person care, for example. Um, there are organizations, individuals, philanthropists throughout the country that are looking at funding these types of things. And the way it works is they would fund it, and then once the bidder, once the vendor reaches certain benchmarks, uh, then we would reimburse. So it's kind of a, a um, make sure you get the results you want without having to you know, risk public funds to do it. Uh, it's been, it's like I said, it's happening across the country. I think it's something that's overdue here, and I'd love to see this, the county of Sacramento be the first local entity to incorporate it. Another way to do it would be a simpler model, and that's just that we don't invite the third party because if that takes too long or something, um, we don't do that, and we just fund it ourselves. But we still have those performance matrices that have to be met in order to reach certain funding cycles. Um, I, I would be very encouraged if we could, if we are going to do an RFP, that we could incorporate some kind of pay for success uh, model in that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Supervisor Peters. Uh, thank you. I, I'm much in agreement with um, Patrick. I think if the department is telling us that they could better use the money elsewhere, then they're supposed to be the experts and that's what we want to do and ever what it, what I have read is that the program that's been put together by staff is the best model um, not to say that um, I uh, and if we did as I said before and if we decide to go forward uh, that we do an RFP um, and St. John's may or may not um, win that RFP, but I think the audit of St. John's needs to continue to go forward so that if they do win the RFP, that all the bases are cleared and they um, uh, there's no question about uh, the finances as to whether they can um, qualify to receive county money. But um, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but I, I just think we have to believe in what we already agreed to fund in June and see how it works. And it might not work. <laughs> we don't know. We have to, uh, but we're, we, we can't continually undermine uh, uh, the program we've already agreed to. And that's kind of where I am. Okay. Okay, I'll just, uh, maybe to echo a few comments I made earlier that, um, in my view, we've had, you know, many community partners over the years to address many community needs, certainly in the realm of addressing homelessness for women and children, um, families. Uh, uh, we've had partners, and certainly um, uh, St. John's and, and Volunteers of America are two of those that, that have been partners for many, many years. And it, it just seems to me that as we've had this conversation, we somehow by funding additional transitional beds that it, how that could equate to um, uh, either detracting or undermining what we've already done. We've, we've funded that, we've supported that, and for this community to say that uh, just because, you know, uh, we, we have a plan, that we're not, we're not breaking that plan, we're supplementing that. And so if we want to have additional transitional vocational beds for our, in, a, in, a, in a program area, then we know that it works. I guess we can disagree about that. I believe that it works. Um, and for a program, that, again, that has grown, obviously, number of beds, which those don't come easily in any respect. I don't, you know, whatever classification, whether it be emergency shelter, permanent supportive housing, transitional, those are all challenges in this community. And I just, it, it, it seems to me that um, if this board chooses to supplement some of those program areas, whether that's what staff recommends or not, I appreciate it, I respect staff's recommendation, uh, but I think to the point I made here, you know, what we're embarking upon, we're not undermining that by supplementing funding. It, it was, it, that to me um, uh, is, 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 a, is a contrary argument, because again, we have the ability to, to fund something that works, and I think that you know, we know serves women and children, probably a thousand uh, women and children go through that program in any given year. Uh, and I just think that, that 
it would be wise for this county to, again, whether St. John's in a competitive process, I'm certainly, it seems to me that that's, you know, where we have to go with this if we're going to um, uh, choose to fund some additional transitional beds is go down the RFP. I guess I would suggest that uh, we ought to do that and do that expeditiously and see what that brings um, uh, because I do think that we're going to be talking here, I imagine, in the next few weeks about winter shelter and what happens with that. Uh, we're going to struggle with how we site a full shelter, uh, a full service shelter. We're probably going to struggle about where we find permanent housing for people in this community. But those are all challenges I think this board and, and the staff and certainly this community are up to tackling. But I guess I, I just don't see for a program that has uh, built a foundation in this community of, of serving homeless women and children with a, a certain approach that um, you know, people can argue about that and you can say, well, we want housing first, or we want low barrier. I'm a believer, and I've said this before in, in, in conversations we've had about this item going back to last fall, that I don't believe there's just one pathway. And again, I think this board can choose to say that we want programs that may have a stronger, clean and sober com component than others. It may be transitional versus um, diversion or permanent supportive housing, but to the point that Supervisor Cerna made earlier, I believe we need all of those things. We can't have them all because we don't have the funding that goes behind them, but we have the ability. We've already roped off the money here. I believe we've got to, uh, you know, with some urgency, I'll put out an RFP and uh, see what the marketplace brings. It may bring us St. John's and a whole host of others. It may not, but um, I, I just got to believe that until we know what else we put in place and have funded is works, why would we abandon something that does? And that's the point I make. So I'm prepared to support going forward with RFP expeditiously and, and uh, uh, would be supportive of a motion to do that today. So Supervisor Kennedy, Cerna, and Frost. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I have a question of the chair, yeah. just, just so yeah. I understand. Because, I mean, you're right. We, I mean, we're not diverting from the plan. I guess, though, I guess the question that I have is we have an opportunity to augment the plan in the most uh, efficacious way as possible. And we're being told by staff that that would be something other than this. I mean, I, I yeah. you know, we're not, I mean, we, we have an opportunity to build on the plan in the best possible way. So I'm just, have, that's, that's where I'm having the disconnect. Oh. And I gather that. I guess I just would respond to that. Um, you know, in, in opening the doors we have, and to build upon that, some of those we haven't even got in place. We may not have them in place before the fiscal year's out. We may have savings in those accounts ultimately to, to get there. It seems to me that for this year, and maybe we gotta just keep the focus on that, for this year though, um, we, you know, we're already full quarter into the fiscal year that uh, maybe as a part of a transition, recognizing that, you know, St. John certainly has a fundraising capacity to, over time, uh, maybe to absorb this. I don't know. I'm not going to speak for them. But, I, but it would seem to me that as we open the doors and build on those things, even if we put more money into some of those areas, I'm not so sure we would expend the money because we don't have the systems in place yet. And, and I don't think we're detracting by funding for this. So maybe, uh, you know, the, 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 the question certainly you pose is one that will be answered over time. But, okay. yeah, yeah. Supervisor Cerna, Supervisor Frost. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'm, I had a similar question as, as did uh, Supervisor Kennedy, and that is if we decide to give direction to staff today to um, develop an RFP process, um, I'm looking at it now from the standpoint of how narrow or why do we make the the target of, of the RFP. And I think we've all said it in one way, shape, or form in the past. Our, you know, our allegiance is to helping the most people that we can, whether they be families or individuals, male or female. Um, and I, you know, as someone that has re repeatedly um, uh, acknowledged the great work that's gone into now two years of work to get us to where we are, and we're at the precipice of implementation, which is great. Um, I'm kind of looking at, an, you know, an RFP process as an opportunity to um, put it out there. How, you know, how best can your organization assist us with uh, uh, augmenting the, the plan? And it's maybe maybe you have a response that comes and comes back and says, "Well, we can help out in this fashion in terms of we can help this many uh, mothers with children, or we can help uh, this many single men, or you know, or this many uh, transition age youth." But I guess at this point, I'm I'm kind of interested in 
um, if again if their votes are here for for an RFP process that we we keep it fairly wide with an eye towards efficacy and um, and that doesn't preclude st. John's from competing it doesn't preclude a lot, whole host of others uh, quite frankly from competing and we may uncover something that we didn't know uh, existed in terms of a, a real sound complement to the work that we've done so far. Okay, Supervisor Frost. Oh, I appreciate Supervisor Kennedy's comments relating to process and making good government decisions. And um, it seems like to me that we are still working through a process that we have not been able to complete and that being trying to identify um, get answers and um, receive information from st. John's and identify um, what they need and what their need is and what uh, what do we need I'm not sure how to go out for an RFP if we're at the same time the staff is telling us making recommendations that we don't need transitional housing and um, there may be other more compelling needs like preventing homelessness and, and attending to those working poor that are on the edge of homelessness. Um, I like, I, I agree that, uh, or I, I concur with, uh, Supervisor Kennedy's comments relating to um, clear direction and a process that makes it uh, easier to uh, fund results. And I have the impression there has been some challenges in this working relationship in the past. Um, I'm not sure how we can go out for an RFP if we're not sure what we want or need. I'm trying to figure that out. How do we just, are we just going to go out for an RFP? I mean, when we don't, I'm not sure how we can do that um, responsibly. I almost feel like we need more information in order to um, identify what that looks like and then there, you know, I, I have in my mind that maybe St. John's can, maybe there's something they can do that they weren't thinking about doing that will help us, you know. Maybe there's another way they can help us um, outside that box that they're in with transitional housing. Maybe there's an, another um, branch of what they do that, that could be, um, could grow their effort. I don't know. But um, I think before we can go out for an RFP, I don't know how do we do that if we don't really feel like we, if, if our staff is recommending that we don't need what we're going out for. Um, so I'm struggling. Um, I'm struggling with that. I, I, I'm compassionate um, to St. John's. Um, still struggling with, um, the fact that St. John's didn't come come back after not getting that bid um, for the other RFP, um, I I guess I, I'm concerned that our you know it's difficult to to move forward on something when we don't have more information and more answers relating to clear a clear direction moving forward. Maybe to, to to get this down to the simplest question then is that um, to your point, and it's been raised in different ways by comments by all members of this board, is if if this board doesn't um, believe or, or or want additional transitional beds, then the RFP would be something different. If it is that over the course of you know, whatever period of time, even if we're just for many portion of the last three quarters of this fiscal year, that you know we would uh, continue down that path and would you know uh, uh, seek transitional beds and then you know see where we go with the other programs and maybe go for a broader RFP at some juncture uh, that would take a longer process and be more broadly um, 
responded to probably. And so I think that is the question though. That's the question here before us is that if we want to go to an RFP, to your point, if we know that's what we, we, we want and we're willing to seek that, then we can give that direction. If we don't, then we can say, go out and you know, kind of give us what it what might look more broadly for an RFP, and that would be a different kind of a process. So I think it kind of boils down to that choice uh, today or very shortly. So, I mean, and, and again, it, based upon staff recommendation, or members, uh, or have come to the conclusion that, um, you know, that's not, we don't want those 19 units of transitional housing because we don't think we need them, or whatever, there's higher needs, then that would be clear because then we would I, I think that going to an RP would be a whole different conversation for a whole other morning or afternoon. So that's kind of my take. I have a question for council. Sure. Uh, are we well within our um, authority today to um, give direction to staff to move forward with an RFP and give some specificity to it? Uh, it, it has been agendized for for direction of what next steps would be so the more you clarify what you would like to see return I think you're within that that agendized okay so <clears throat> we've all weighed in so I, I guess if we're gonna go down and entertain if there's a desire to do an RP what that's gonna yeah. you know, what people would want it to look like so supervisor Kennedy you punched up first <clears throat> actually like like Supervisor Cerna's idea a lot. Um, I just, from a staff perspective, who have done a lot more of these than I have, um, what's that look like? I mean, is there a way to to accomplish that? Well, th there are any number of uh, ways you could give us direction on how to frame a request for proposals in this context. Um, you could simply give us the authority based on your discussion and based on the objectives of the plan that you've already approved. We could then establish what the criteria would be for evaluating proposals. Uh, we could put uh, any number of conditions on on the on the contract related to that. Supervisor Peters and I are not serving on that committee. <laughs> <laughs> we checked that box. <laughs> you read our mind. I think what part of that is we can structure it. It's more what is it that we're procuring? So that's the question that comes in. You can leave it fairly broad. We do have our objectives. We could construct a, a suggestion will be we can put that out that these are the four initiatives that the board's interested in, give us a proposal, right? I'm looking back to make sure they, they agree with me. But you could do it that broad, you can give that broad of a direction, or you could say well, of those initiatives, one, two, three, or four, which one you want. But what I heard Supervisor Cerna say was, is very intriguing that we have a plan, and there could be something that we haven't thought about. That somebody could come back and say, um, here's a different idea, here's something different. I think Supervisor Frost, you said that. It could be St. John's, it could be somebody else that comes back with that. It gives us the maximum flexibility rather than getting us locked into yeah. 19 units for this much. Yeah, I guess the way I'm looking at it is, um, and I know this is very, very general, but it's like, whatever helps the most amount of people and that complements the plan that we've already spent a lot of time and energy on. Would it be possible for the department to throw their hat in the ring and explain how they would spend it if they had that? I mean, that, that could certainly be an option as well. I mean, staff would probably, we, we, we would be more than happy to put our I'd heads together that. and identify some well, of these priority one, areas. Yeah. And so since we heard that they had, would spend it in a different way, but we don't know what that is. So. Yeah, that you. could work for me. I'm sorry. Okay, Susan, go ahead. I didn't know he sell the floor, so you went anything else? Well, he didn't want to argue with me. No, I guess not. <laughs> he didn't want to be on the committee either, either so. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so Patrick, maybe make a motion, or Phil, you know. I forget who said what down there. All right. So I guess I would move that uh, we direct staff to move forward with uh, an RFP process that um, generally seeks to um, <clears throat> serve the most people, uh, and that could be people described as families, people as individuals, male, female, um, uh, no, no limits on age. Um, and then the second major part to that is to uh, have a, have a, 
a keen eye towards how it complements or um, perhaps even fills a, a void in the uh, five initiatives that we've uh, been moving forward with for the last two years. Is that and clear that enough? Includes that's very clear. Now I get. Do we still want to have this pay for success model and incorporate? I think it? that's that. That's definitely that's a given. What I would like to do is not tie it in so that it's a requirement, but I would like part of the process to be for us to reach out and see and 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 Got it. It. Fair, com the fair competition potential. for. It. Got it. Um, yeah. Okay. Understood. It's a motion and a second. Did Patrick second? Yes, he did. Okay. And the motion carries with Supervisor Natoli voting no. Okay. Okay. Ask Mr. Gill before you. <clears throat> there was one other component. Then, are you reporting back on the other aspects of this? Sorry. Did you asked for another 30 days on the other issues. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yes, part of the the other request is for us to come back to you in 30 days. So that will be October 31st. I would like to give you a status report on our work with St. John's. Okay, all right. That's <clears throat> understood then. Okay. All right, that's all on the published agenda. We do have a number of speakers that uh, had signed up off agenda and been very patient, so we appreciate uh, you being with us. And uh, I'll take these in the order they were handed. And if there are others that came in that wish to address it, we'll take it. I'm going to... I think for, as I've done in the past, we allow up to 15 minutes on one topic area, so I'll put 15 up there, and if you don't use that all, I've got four speakers here, rather than just give three minutes for each one, let's just do that, so let me. And first is Alicia Lee and Elsie Taylor, and then Victor Karloff, and then Helen Harris. And you may have other speakers as well, but so, and if there's, <clears throat> that's the order they were given to me. Lisa. Hi, how are you doing today? Very good. My name is Alicia. Well, I'm here today on behalf of SEIU 2015, our union, and I'm here today wondering when are we going to get a contract signed? And when are we going to get a raise? We've been making $10.80 an hour, and um, I've done the math over and over and over, and I don't see where I'm going to be able to retire on that nor am I going to be able to start a 401k plan. You know, we, we can barely live. I can barely pay my rent. You know, and we're losing our houses and our homes behind not making enough money. And what, what is it that we need to do to get you guys to understand that we as caregivers deserve a whole lot more than you're giving us. We're responsible for people's lives. And that's a big deal. You guys should give us a fair contract. We're not asking for a whole lot. I mean, $15 an hour is minimum wage already. We deserve it. When we go into these houses, you expect us to go in there and take good care of these clients, and that's what we do. These clients depend on us to come in there and take good care of them. I've worked as a CNA. As I've also worked at, as an LVN. You know, so what's the difference? I did more work as a CNA than I did an LVN, and I gave, got paid more money as an LVN than I did as a CNA. I can give a shot here and there, for $32 an hour, but I go into someone's house, I'm still responsible for their meds, I'm still responsible for their ADLs, and I get $10.80 an hour. It's not fair. And I just want you to think about that today. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Okay, next, Elsie. And then Victor. And Hi, then my John. name is Elsie. And I concur with everything that she's saying, but I want to add to it. 
that some of these people homes that we go into some of them, that's all they have is us that's coming in there and, it, and, it, and when we get up in there and we don't get enough hours as is for you guys to even think or anybody to think about cutting something instead of giving something and we barely making it with what we're getting already and some of us have to have more than one client to even try to even make rent because of the simple fact that we're not getting paid enough and then you think about if it was your parent or you when you get old and somebody want to come up in your house and take care of you would want them to be compensated for the work that they do or your mother or your grandmother or grandfather or whoever you know it's not fair to us and we go in and we try to keep these people with much dignity as possible because you think about it if they have to come from there they homes and have to go into a facility which I done worked in a facility as well it's not enough staffing in there they're not even getting enough money to uh, for people you could be in there uh, say like you giving somebody a shower or something one of your lights on your hall go off you can't hear a light go off because there's nobody else there for you all you know somebody is on the floor or something so for somebody to be talking about taking something instead of giving us something and we try to keep these people we should be respected and getting paid to do the job that we do and because a lot of us go into places we, and, and work more than the hours that we allow to work that we get paid for working for because it takes longer and if you realize the older people get the more hours they need you could go with somebody and you start out with so, so many hours and them hours stay like that but they age and they age and their health is getting poorer and poorer but you're working harder and harder but you're not being compensated for what you're doing i think it's very unfair and they need to step up and give us what we need and to keep these people in their home so they can keep as much dignity as possible thank you thanks elsie <clears throat> okay elsie's followed by victor and then helen this is the last one i have signed up Good afternoon, Victor. Good afternoon. My name is Victor, and in my brief address to the uh, members of the board, uh, I'd like to uh, stress out not just the importance of uh, uh, work people do for our uh, seniors and our people who need help, who can support themselves and who can take care of themselves. I am stressing out the uh, the needs of of uh, caregivers, and at this point, I want to uh, tell that these people are feeling a little bit deprived at this point because uh, for the work they do, they just get paid a little bit less than all the categories of workers. And uh, yeah, the millions of people who work in uh, different businesses or industries and the, the people who work for uh, as a providers, uh, they'd like to feel themselves the equal to the other people, to the other workers and they need just decent pay, um, appropriate uh, health care program, um, and uh, the uh, plan for the retirement plan, more or less uh, uh, supportive. And at this point, uh, I'd like to ask the board members to consider while we're, you are uh, making decisions regarding to the uh, uh, financing in the times of scarcity of budget I understand uh, take into consideration that these people are not worse not better they are equal they should be treated equally and to uh, express our appreciation of what they do for our society so it's in your hand to find out the means and sources of financing additional financing for this program and to well to express your opinion and your support to these people I uh, appreciate your time and efforts and thank you very much <clears throat> thank you Victor okay. and then Helen so Helen's the last one I have signed up there's anybody else who wishes to speak so otherwise Helen will be the last one on the side mm -hmm. hi Helen hi how are you fine good to see you I came here a year ago you did. and by chance I uh, went to visit a friend of mine. We were neighbors about, not, this is a story, old story, I told you guys the same thing. But I was so passionate when I came before you. And because I had gone to visit her and uh, she had become handicapped. 
And uh, as I would go and visit her, um, she needed help. Now she had a uh, in support service worker, but she wasn't doing that much. I mean, she was doing a lot, but she needed extra help. And I was traveling 30 miles a day to go and visit her, and it you know got to be pretty expensive for me. So I signed up to be an IHSS uh, ser support service worker to defray any costs that I might have. Gas, just gas. So it wasn't necessarily money that that I was concerned about. But I was concerned about her dignity and her self-respect. I had stood with her 45 years ago, and I saw her breaking down. And then as I worked for her, I saw myself breaking down too. Because that compassion that I have for humanity came into play. And some nights I'd go home crying. Not only for her, but for myself. When I realized, because when I first got, it wasn't about the money. But when I realized that the money that I was making was not commensurate to the amount of time and energy and care that I was putting in for her. And I hadn't gotten into talking with all these nice people. But then when I got into uh, uh, connecting to SEIU, then I, I, I'm standing in solidarity with them right now as I was back when. When I stood before you guys last year, and I, I'm sorry to say you guys because I really do respect the pedal, so I don't mean to We've been you know, use worse. Uh, okay, okay, well, I'm just going to be That's mean. fine, Kelly. Okay, thank Thanks. you, thank you. But, but uh, in solidarity, you know, I was thinking, at that time, I, I hollered out, and I'm sorry I did, because I said, give us an ear, please, give us an ear. Yeah. And at that time, I had hope. But along with everything else that's happening, you know, in our world right now, I feel like a non-entity. And God knows I want to have hope. I want to have hope. And it's not about me. I mean, I say we, the voice. We want to have hope. I don't know. I don't know what you do when you go outside of this panel right here. But when you go back to your offices, when you talk, whatever power you have, I'm not asking for equality. I'm not. Equity is what we want. We want a piece of that pie. $10.80 isn't going to give us dignity. And every time we come up here and ask, please hear us. Please listen to us. Please give us an ear. Compassion is a mighty big word. It's a powerful word. I'm humble before you today and asking you for compassion. I'm pleading. So I had a lot of things I was going to say when I get up here to hear this all gone. What I do? I say our voices are crying out, not for equality, but for equity. And again, I say, please hear us. And whatever you can do when you leave this panel, Think about us. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for sharing once again. Okay, Abdul, you got in under the wire. That's one, huh? Yes. All right. Thanks. Abdul Awad, Home Care, Sacramento. I've been a, I've been here before. I've been in your office before. Nice I have the pleasure to meet you and take a selfie with you. <laughs> uh, you have to take it. Been while, it's been a while, you guys. We've been coming back here every other day. And we wait, you know, to, to just to hear our story. Every, every, everybody here has a story. But we said enough is enough. Next year, the minimum wage is going to be $11. We're going to go back to the minimum wage. We are a 24,000 member in Sacramento. We are an army. But we deserve some dignity, respect. Average home care provider making in Sacramento, 18,000. 
$18,000 a year. Who could live on $18,000 a year? Versus, God forbid, if we decide to give up our patient, our client, to the state and the county, it will cost sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year. So we are saving money, we're saving life. We're keeping the loved one at home and safe. But we deserve some dignity and respect. We are tired and sick to keep coming back and bother you guys. Our contract is open now. We're looking for fair contracts. It took us almost a year, four years ago, to get 40 cents. I was one of the bargaining team. 40 cents increase 2012. Guess what? We just came back from the tribunal blocks when Arnold took 4% and 4%. 2008, 2009. So we're always on the job in the blocks. They call us a babysitter. We're not a babysitter. We put so many hats every morning. My brother Robert right here, he, he changed feeding tube every morning. Each time he go, when I go vacation and leave his house, leave his client with his kid, he have to pay somebody maybe $30, $40 an hour to do the same job. We are CNA, we are doctor, LVN, home care, whatever you want to call us. We keep him the loved one at home. We keep him safe. We're saving the county and the state and the federal money. But we deserve some dignity. We deserve some, we deserve some livable wages. We're not asking for much. 1080, nobody could live on 1080. Look the inflation, look the gas, the housing. Now it's gonna take us another, maybe a year. Our contract is open now. To get another 40 cents, it's a baby steps. We have to fight almost for four or five years to get the overtime. Have you ever heard in your lifetime, people doesn't get overtime? Actually. Google it. <laughs> for 40 years, we didn't get overtime. For 40 years, we didn't get travel time. We didn't get waiting time. Why? We are average American, average citizen. As a matter of fact, we go extra mile for the patient. So once again, guys, I know you got sick of me. I've been here so many times. I appreciate your time, and I appreciate the job you do. Please pay attention to us. Please pay attention to us. Our contract is open, is in your hand. And guess what? We're not going nowhere. We keep coming back, and we could tip the scale for the election too. That's not a threat. Just to let you know, we are 24,000 people here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and uh, I know that we'll continue to you know work at the negotiating table. Uh, and again, appreciate your comments and your service to others in our community. So it is important. All right, uh, that's the only uh, speakers I had then. So I'll bring back to the board uh, any adjournments. I know. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. I just had a comment. No, no, oh, I'm sorry. Comments and students. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to uh, publicly uh, thank uh, John Wheat and all his staff. Uh, as uh, we all had a chance to see last week, uh, J.D. Powers, uh, I guess, uh, re registered uh, their vote for SMF as uh, best at, at their scale, uh, best airport in the nation. So that's something that this entire organization should be proud of, but especially uh, as I made mention of in social media, uh, all of our devoted uh, public servants that make our airport system uh, what it is, and certainly our international airport. So congratulations to everyone that contributed to that uh, selection as, uh, as number one ranked uh, in the United States uh, for our size. Thanks, man. I just, after looking at Supervisor Cerna all day, I'd like to adjourn in his memory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling that way, let me tell you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Supervisor Frost, anything? Supervisor Peters, anything else? Mr. Gill, anything? Nope. Okay. Uh, before we do adjourn, just want to acknowledge that we're going to adjourn in memory of Michael Turner and um, also want to um, ask <clears throat> yeah, so that we adjourn uh, another former longtime employee of Sacramento County, Lowell Bowman, who served as the assistant assessor uh, for Sacramento County uh, in his uh, latter years. He actually started with the assessor's office in 1963, worked there until uh, October 1995. He um, was a very dedicated county employee, uh, someone who I knew, uh, his, uh, his wife, uh, late wife, uh, uh, Terry Bowman, uh, actually worked as secretary to District 5 uh, back when my predecessor, Toby Johnson, was a supervisor, but also carried over and worked for me for a bit of time uh, in the early part of my uh, years as a supervisor. Um, he had uh, three children, uh, uh, Carrie, Michael, and Craig. Uh, some of them in these chambers at different times for different items uh, that have been before the board. And many, many grandchildren. Um, he um, had some health challenges in recent years, but uh, never uh, 
uh, gave up the spirit of, um, of certainly of friendship, but also of uh, wanting to live and have a productive life. And so uh, he passed away a couple of days ago, and so I'd ask that uh, on behalf of uh, this board, we enter in memory of uh, Michael Turner and Lowell Bo Bowman. And with that, if there's no other adjournments, then we will adjourn in their memory.